Hola a todos. Hoy os traigo una entrevista muy especial para mí. Mike es un productor americano con grandes discos a sus espaldas con el que he tenido el placer de trabajar este mismo año y que para mi sorpresa se ha dejado engañar un poquito y me ha dejado hacerle algunas preguntas sobre su carrera. Con vosotros el genial Mike Mericonda. La primera pregunta que te hago, Mike, es sobre tus inicios en la producción musical, en tu carrera. Eh, ¿Cómo fue y por qué empezaste en este mundo? Well, I was living in New Jersey. I was 15. I started playing the guitar for three years and I was in local bands that, was, that were playing covers of The Who and, and The Damned. Of course, punk rock had just started in 77. So my parents wanted to send me to the university and I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but I thought <laughs> making records would be an interesting thing. I mean, I was 17 years old or, or whatever and I didn't really know too much about it. I'd never been in a studio. So we had done some research and found out that there were, there were three universities that actually had a program of producing records and be, or being a, a, an engineer in music. Um, and one of them was in New York, and I passed the audition. It was decided that I was going to go live in Manhattan in 1980. I, had, I was 18 years old. And I'd been living in the suburbs, so, you know, being, being unleashed. And of course, my parents said, oh, we're not spending all, Michael, we're not spending all this money for you to, to start a band, you know? Mm -hmm. And the first thing I did was start a band in New York when I went there because I was in Manhattan. Manhattan was, you know, all energy. So, so I started the University of New York that had a joint program with uh, what they call a trade school for, techni for technicians. It was the first time that the university had kind of accepted producing records or engineering was a viable career to study at the university <laughs> before that it was a it was a trade what they call like being an auto mechanic um or you would have to be a becario an intern mm -hmm. and sit and watch and learn from the guys and sometimes they would tell you secrets and sometimes they wouldn't you know <laughs> <laughs> but you'd get coffee and you'd bring coffee to the clients and you'd uh -huh. you'd go out and you'd get food and you'd have to learn that way so so basically i did four years at the university so we're talking about 1980 and you know punk kind of wasn't happening in new york it had already died but there was a lot of disco going on Mm -hmm. And as we were talking about, rap was kind of coming up through the underground. So it was kind of an interesting time to get involved. Everything was, at that point, was, was analogic. And all of the studios really didn't have any computers. I mean, there were four-track studios. There were eight-track studios. The big studios sometimes had two 24-track machines connected. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you were doing like a, a record like Pink Floyd, yeah, you'd need more than 24 tracks. So they were connected by a synchronization cable. But the smaller studios, and there were, or there were also demo studios where you could record to a cassette. Now, this is how <laughs> groups started out. If you wanted to get a show at CBGB's, mm. you basically had to have a cassette to give them. Mm. So you would go to a studio small, The guy maybe would have a 16 channel input board and he'd record direct, he'd do a live mix, mm -hmm. and that would be your demo tape. So, <laughs> and then you make copies and you bring it to CBGBs and say, hey, you know, here's my group, here's my phone number, you know, you know, if we can get a gig. So, you know, that was part of the process of, of trying to get shows in New York. You needed to have some kind of documentation of what your group sounded like. Or, so there were, there were, enough studios in New York of various sizes, some like Electric Ladyland, of course, had two 24-track machines. You always had to have two multi-tracks in case one broke down, because if it broke down, you were losing three days of work. So you'd always have to have a backup machine. Mm -hmm. And with that multi-track, whether it be a four-track or an eight-track, a 16-track or a 24-track, 
you would mix back down to quarter inch two track. Mm -hmm. and that would be your mix. So mm -hmm. in effect, you'd have to have any real studio would have to have three tape machines. Mm -hmm. not, not just one you know you have to have, you have to have your primary tape machine a backup in case something something screwed up with the uh, with the main recorder and your machine to mix down to mm -hmm. so every day those machines had to be maintained and cleaned you know so you clean them with alcohol you'd set up the test tape calibrate the machine i mean this is a daily process especially at the big studios and they had technicians and they had on-site People, I mean, now studios are run by one person. Mm -hmm. Normally, the bigger studios had five or six people. If you, you know, if you read about um, Abbey Road and they, you know, they had like ten people working during a Beatles session. Now it's down to one person <laughs> because we don't make any money. <laughs> we can't. There's more than one person working at the studio. So, so back in the day, it was usually a team of people. Smaller studios usually had two. Bigger studios had maybe five six employees mm -hmm. and separate producers that would come in and bring work so so that's pretty much how i got involved with it and what had happened was i had gotten a job at a record store while i was working at the university and i was very lucky to get this job it was the last year i think i was i was 20 when i got the job at the record store and the record store was kind of mining the underground garage scene because being that punk had died there was a lot of interest in old music like rockabilly reissues uh especially nuggets garage bands mm -hmm. things from the 60s people were kind of interested in these kind of obscure records and it, garage rock from the 60s was becoming a real big thing there were reissues coming out the rockabilly stray cats were starting i mean everybody was kind of in this retro thing because punk had kind of died you know mm -hmm. so everybody was kind of looking back at older music and i was learning more in the, in the record shop <laughs> and making connections with people because the cramps would come in and people would come in and buy records mm -hmm. i mean it was kind of a it was kind of an education in itself and I was spending more time <laughs> in the record store than I was in the like, university at last year because I was meeting all these people and listening to all these records and being exposed to this and, you know, meeting all these people that were putting out reissues and, and, and these obscure records. So you know, between having worked at the record store, all this was happening in Manhattan in the 80s. And, you know, I mean, it was like any city, like Valencia or, or Madrid or, or, or any city. It was, it, was, it was dangerous. It was an underground going on there, mm -hmm. you know. There were illegal clubs that were open without a license all night long till the morning, you know. Mm -hmm. there, there was activity going on. And, you know, when you're young and you're 20 years old, you can do that. <laughs> I can't do it now. But, you know, the, we, we used to play at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning in New York. It was, it was completely illegal. You know, and that's how my band got its start for was playing these, you know, illegal late night after hours clubs. And it was pretty normal because the living conditions in New York, generally you were living in a shitty apartment with a roommate you didn't like with cockroaches. You couldn't really cook there. So you didn't really spend too much time in the apartment because everybody was kind of out on the street, you know? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't impossible to, like, walk into a bar and see Andy Warhol mm -hmm. or Lou Reed. I mean, because they were at Max's Kansas City. They were actually, like, everybody was out. You know, nobody was home on the internet or whatever. There were people didn't even have TVs, so you didn't really spend too much time in the house, except to, to maybe shower and sleep, and then you go out to a club or you go out you go out to a record store or whatever. Um, the culture, I think, at that point, as opposed to now. I mean, I stay home a lot now. I'm older, of course, but you know, there was activity out on the street. You could see things and because there was no internet and there was no phone, you would walk out and you'd see a, a poster, you know, on a, a pinned up on a wall saying, oh, well, you know, hardcore show, punk rock show, $2, here, five bands. And it would be agnostic friend or something. Yeah, you have to go out to know what, to, <laughs> to know where to go and make contacts, you know. You couldn't make contacts in your house because there weren't any computers. So mm -hmm. if you weren't out on the street talking to people, you really couldn't get anything done. So that was kind of going on um, at that point. So I had met Tim Warren from Crypt, who was always coming in the record store. And Crypt had started with the 
Back from the Grave series of, of reissues of unknown garage bands. I remember when he came in in 1983 with a copy of the record, you know, he actually did his own compilation from singles, you know, that were rare. And he gave me a copy, and that kind of started a whole boom of groups listening to basically do-it-yourself homemade musicians. I mean, you know, a lot of these recordings were done with two microphones with teenage kids in 1966. Mm -hmm. So everybody kind of thought, okay, after this punk thing, it's like, yeah, I can pick up a guitar, it's three chords, you know, and there was mm -hmm. kind of a garage movement going on. Now, when I got friendly with Tim, Tim started doing new groups. Mm -hmm. um, he had spent some time in Europe, and he was releasing some new groups along with the, the records from the 60s. So... <clears throat> He came to me, I, I, and he, as he was doing these new groups, like the Ron Chans and the Devil Dogs and the New Bomb Turks and mm -hmm. Nine Pound Hammer, uh, because I had gone to school for him. <laughs> so, so I basically became his house producer uh, in the 90s, and any group, or most of the groups that were on Crypt, I would be in charge of the production because I had gone to school for it, and I knew it. Mm -hmm. At that point, we... Uh, we were working out in Brooklyn at Coyote Records, which was, they started out in a rehearsal space with a four track, then they moved out to Brooklyn, they got an eight track. Ooh, we we're all, everybody's so happy we we're recording on eight track. So, so a lot of those records were done on eight track in, out in Brooklyn at Coyote. And again, because there was no internet and you couldn't really study, and really I didn't, I was a guitar player. I, my, the guy who was, Engineering the sessions was a guy named Albert Coyote. That's why the studio is called Co Coyote, because he was an Italian called mm -hmm. Albert Coyote. And he was a drummer, you know, and I was a guitar player. So he knew how to tune a drum. He knew how to mic a drum kit. So I learned so much from <laughs> working with that engineer about how drums should sound, because I didn't know, you know. I just played the guitar, the guitar and, the, and a little piano. So we're, having worked with Albert, I was learning a lot about miking drums and stuff and it really every studio that you went to and even here i mean you know i mean people are watching me saying oh you know it's like your, te your te technique is revolutionary it's, like, oh, it's really simplistic it's minimalist um but every session you go to you try to learn from somebody you know mm -hmm. you can learn from the drummer you can learn from anybody about where a microphone should go how, how things should be tuned you know and things like that so you know i was lucky to have to have gotten that that job for crypt and from there after that when the crypt group started touring europe a lot of european bands started asking me to, to come and, and work over here so i wound, wound up living over here for part of the time then moved back to america um and then came back here to, to do it but um I paralleled my career because really when I left the university and I started working in a studio, uh, they were doing disco, you know, mm -hmm. and they were taking a lot of drugs, you know, and I really didn't like the ambience of well, like, like, man, I'm not going to make disco records. I can't, you know, I can't. It's not really the music I like. I, mm -hmm. I can't stand it. So I moved into being a television editor and started making money uh, that way. You know, mm. and kept the music production kind of as a hobby, as a pasatiempo, as a hobby. So I didn't have to be at a studio every day making disco records or doing anything I didn't want to like to do, you know. So in that respect, I was lucky because I got to work with the groups that I liked. Mm. And I never had to do like a speed metal band or a rap mm. band, you know, things, things that I didn't really want to do, you know. Mm. So uh, really, it was kind of a luxury for me to, you know, it was fine. I could be a prostitute in, in video and make TV commercials, you know. <laughs> and conversely, there were filmmakers that were working when I was working as a video editor that were independent filmmakers. And they were like, man, these guys are spending more money on a, on a Smirnoff's vodka commercial. I could have made, made three feature films, independent films with the money. I didn't care because I wasn't really interested in making movies. But I was interested in making money. And I knew I, if I was going to do it in music, I would have to be a prostitute. You know, mm -hmm. I would have to compromise my whole vision. So I basically kept music as on the side so it wouldn't ruin, ruin me. I mean, any 
whether you're playing or whether you're producing or, or, you know, when anything becomes a job, even if it's a marriage or whatever, then it's a job and you don't like it. (laughs) So I try to avoid having my principal money income coming from music because I knew I'd have to do things that I didn't want to do mm-hmm. and I didn't want to hate my job because I loved music. So I figured I'd, you know, I, I'd go work in television. So I kind of was working in two fields at the same mm-hmm. time. You know? mm-hmm. And then um, after a couple of years in Madrid, uh, working with the Pleasure Fuckers and the Vancouver's and some of the underground groups there. I was hanging out in Madrid illegally for a year, uh, kind of working and checking out the scene. Um, it was Sex Museum and people were all in Malasania. It was, there seemed to be this great condensation of music and music lovers there. And a lot of people were listening to American music and stuff from him, from from the UK and Australian records. I mean, these were not cheap, you know, but to say that, I mean, people were buying them, Radio Birdman mm-hmm. records. I mean, there were, you know, Malasani was just blasting with, like, the Sonics and Little Richard, and that didn't really exist in New York, you know? <laughs> people were listening to disco, you know, in the bars, you know? So for me, it was kind of a paradise to see Madrid and all this movement of rock and roll, and mm-hmm. because, really, we're only talking about, like, 10 years after Franco died, you know? So it was kind of real big explosion in the 80s of rock and roll that was going on, particularly in Madrid, capital city. And uh, I just thought the energy was good there. So I stayed there for a year or two illegally and then moved down to Texas and continued Mm -hmm. to work in television and the music scene in Texas. Um, In Texas, I connected with a studio that was... The first digital studio, digital studio. They had these D88s. They look like VHS cassettes, mm-hmm. and they have like eight track and eight track. You put two VHS in, and mm-hmm. that was the first time I recorded on digital. I'd never seen anything like it, you know. Mm-hmm. But it was like a digital VHS tape. I think they're called D8 D88s or something. That format only lasted a couple of years, and then it went to that mm-hmm. that kind of digital tape thing. But there was a studio down there called Sweatbox that was in a locale, like a practice space. And uh, I walked in there, and they, they were charging $10, $10 an hour to record there. Mm-hmm. I walked in there, and it, I was like, man, I can't make a record here. And it turned out to be a really great studio in the end because the technicians were good, mm-hmm. and they kind of understood what I was doing. I mean, it was a low-budget place. There was graffiti all over the walls, and there were big cockroaches. And, you know, it was not <laughs> not a great place to be, but mm-hmm. it, was, it was kind of the underground of, of Texas. So immediately I got in with those guys and started using them <clears throat> and a lot of groups because I had worked with Crip and I worked with European groups. A lot of the Texas punk bands and, and garage bands started calling me about working, so I immediately got in on that scene. So that's kind of the first 10 years of it. <laughs> Yo he trabajado contigo y la verdad es que me gusta mucho verte trabajar y tu forma de afrontar los proyectos eh, y tu método, digamos. ¿Puedes hablarnos un poco sobre tu forma de trabajar? Well, I think the main thing is you have to create an ambience for the musicians primarily to get them comfortable to play. I don't think the most important thing. I mean, you know, microphone placement and, and doing the technical things are important, but I think it's important to, to, to get the, the, the band playing as good as they can. I think in order to do that, again, they have to drop, get rid of their mobile. They have to, I mean, they have to play with their friends in the room like the practice. You know, you can't play alone. It's like eating alone. I mean, I mean, the experience of making a record is a communal experience. It, it basically is like a basketball team. It's like, a mm-hmm. sport, you, know, it's, uh, you know, you got five guys playing basketball. You got five guys in the, in the room together. That, that's what you need. You need visual contact and you need to have a comfortable ambience or else you're not really going to capture the energy of the group. Because as we were talking before, if... 
you're trying you're trying to document it and take pictures on Instagram and look at your mobile or look at this or look at that. You're using that energy when you should be playing your instrument. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think it's important that everybody gets a hundred percent behind their job. I mean, if you if you're the drummer, you got to play the drums, and that's what you got to do that day. You know, you can't think about anything else. And again, I think it, you know it, it, to capture the energy of the group working together they have to be in the same room looking at each other because it's basically the same thing as a concert. You can't play the concert alone, and you can't really go to the practice alone. I mean, you can, but, you know, music is a communal thing. And, you know, look, you know, here in Spain, I think eating is a very communal thing. I mean, <clears throat> paella in Valencia is to be done with a number of people, and everybody, you know... Puts puts their four. I mean that's that's tradition, you know. Mm. It's not really quite the same as eating in your house by yourself. You know, <laughs> you don't have that that ambience of sharing with your friends. You know, so I think every year, especially after the pandemic, people are getting more and more isolated. Mm. You know, they're recording at home, they're eating at home. There's less communal activity. And I think when you have that communal activity and the energy and your friends are out, you're drinking a couple of beers and you're enjoying the experience, that's what I document, you know. And that's all I do. I mean, I'm, I'm just a documenter, you know. I, don't, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I play an instrument. And I, have, I have experience. I went to school for this. But, you know, you just try to capture the group like a photographer. I mean, you want to get things as natural as possible. Now... I know photographers and, you know, that's another job that's becoming obsolete. There aren't photographers professionally, but, you know, when you needed a promo photo of your group or if you needed pictures of the studio, you'd pay a professional photographer to come in, take pictures, take pictures of the group. You know, these would be developed on a, on a, on a piece of paper. You'd have the, the print and, you know, now everybody's a photographer. And, and so, you know, I mean, I think it's a question of just saying, like, okay, I'm going to play the drums and just play the drums today, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do my my part. And I think, you know, part of the documentation thing, when it comes into play, and we can talk about this a little, a little bit later, is I might be a little off topic on this, but, you know, during the pandemic, I, I was spending a lot of time alone in Barcelona. I did a lot of thinking. I, I was listening to music a lot. I was watching a lot of movies, you know. And I thought, well, you know, I like Alfred Hitchcock movies. These are very planned, you know. And I started getting influenced by directors, by film directors, mm -hmm. instead of producers, which I'd been listening to Joe Meek. I was listening to various producers to try to learn, you know, Brian Wilson and Phil Spector and people like that, try to learn, see what they were doing. During the pandemic, I was watching movies and I was actually influenced by directors. Now, now this is a good thing because when I was learning guitar as a teenager, <clears throat> my teacher told me, well, maybe you shouldn't listen to guitar players. Maybe you should listen to uh, John Coltrane. Maybe you should listen to a sax player. Maybe that'll help you, help you get some ideas, you know? Mm -hmm. So I started watching these movies and I thought, okay, you got a guy like Hitchcock who's planned out everything. Everything is planned. You know, much like Brian Wilson, you know. And then on the other hand, you have a filmmaker like John Cassavetes who's improvising, mm -hmm. much like Rudy Van Gelder, document, document, as he's doing documentation of a group that's just improvising. He doesn't know it's gonna, how long the song's going to go on. And then you have stuff that's super planned, you know. So, and of course, he can work both ways, but these are the two extremes. Complete improvisation or complete pre-production and planning. You know? And there's various middle grounds. Like I said, it doesn't have to be one or the other. They can be mixed, but you know, tr I'm just trying to think of like how much pre-production a group needs. Now, the important thing, I think, to get the group comfortable is you gotta meet with them before, you gotta listen to what they're doing, you gotta know their history, you gotta know what they like, you gotta know what they don't like. You have to represent them when you're, docu when you're documenting them. You have to represent them correctly. So to get every piece of information you can get 
if the drummer says, well, I like Joy Division or I like 80s post, I know I'm going to have to make the snare sound like mm-hmm. gated, like a kind of 80s drum sound, and I can do that. You know, it's not my favorite thing to do, but, you know, mm-hmm. if that's what they want to do, if that's where they want to go with it, that's what you do. But until you know what their reference is and what they want to be and what their identity is, now that can, that can change between members. Maybe the guitar player's got another idea. He wants he wants to sound like the Stray Cats. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe maybe the drummer likes Bowie. So, basically, with all these references, you have to kind of compile what you need to get an accurate documentation of what the group sounds like. Sometimes it's easy enough. You can tell right away. Okay, this group loves the cramps. You know, mm-hmm. it's an easy job. You know, they they want to sound like garbage. I can do that. You know. <laughs> 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 they want to sound primitive. They want to sound bad. They want to sound raw. That's fine, you know. So you don't go for a spectacular production. You know, you don't need to, and that's not what they want. You know, they want it to sound bad. They want it to sound dirty. They want it to sound raw, and they want it to sound, you know, like a punk band. Hmm. So, I guess that answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> Sobre los micrófonos que utilizas, creo que son Electro Boys. Hablamos un poco de ellos y, y aparte de esos que usas tú, algunos otros que tengas como favoritos. Right. Well, I like the Electro Voice for, for various reasons because when you talk about recording in the 50s, really there weren't a lot of European microphones that were imported to America because Sure was putting out microphones, Electro Voice. I mean, America had its microphones, Europe had its own microphones, and both both Europe and America have my some favorite microphones mm-hmm. certainly Europe and you know Germany and and you know AK, AKG and Sennheiser mm-hmm. are fantastic mics normally I like dynamic mics because they're very directional and if I'm recording like I do usually with four people in a room I can't, I want something that's directional that's going to kind of isolate and not pick up the other instruments. So normally I'll use dynamics. Electro voice, I like. They're called the the 664, 665, and the 666 are called the Buchanan hammer because they're heavy, you know, <laughs> and they're like a hammer. <laughs> like, And because of, I think, the quality of the metal is there's a, a kind of a resonance like you're singing into a saxophone they're very heavy microphones and they have a tendency to be have a lot of mid-range in them to make things sound fuller now i was being a fan of bo diddley there was a documentary that was floating around on uh, i don't know 20 years ago and it was in chess records and Phil Chess was running the session, and Bo Diddley was playing, and he, he said, put a 665 or a 666 over here, put a 668. It was all electric voice in Chess, and I love Chess Records, and I love Sun Records, and I love Stax Records. So I started doing a little research and found out that the premier microphone for broadcast was a 666. Mm-hmm. Now, John F. Kennedy and Aretha Franklin well, and Elvis all well, have pictures of them. I mean, this is a Alta Gamma of 1964 mm-hmm. that, you know, if you were going to f- record the voice, if John Kennedy was making a speech or if Aretha Franklin was singing, that was the mic you would use. Mm-hmm. So those microphones were at Chess Studios, they were at Stack Studios, they were in Motown, and that's kind of why I like the sound of the of the old electro voices because they, they capture that. That's not to say that the European microphones aren't great. The dynamics are great. Sennheisers are great. AKGs are great. Um, the ribbon microphones and in in England, those Reslos. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, those are in every church in every public school. I mean, they were mass produced, like the electro voice, for every school and every church, every politician had a Reslo. You know? yeah. Now they're expensive, and they're, but they're great ribbon mics. You know? I like those too. Um, but generally, that's the reason why I like the electric voice. And people say, oh, you know, Sure 57, you know, it's kind of boring, you know. Well, the reality is 
the Shure 57 is the most heard microphone in the history of music. <laughs> Every guitar has had a 57. Every snare drum has had a 57. Every live show that I went to in America, they were using a Shure 57. So people say, oh, well, it's, some, it's, a, you know, it's a little obvious you're using a Shure 57 because it's not it's an expensive microphone, but it is the most listened to microphone. <laughs> That's to say... <laughs> Like, McDonald's is not the best hamburger, but it is the most eaten hamburger. <laughs> not necessarily the best, but there's a reason why McDonald's has sold that many hamburgers. And there's a reason why the Shure 57 mic has been used. And they still sound great to me. I mean, everyone from Neil Young has, has used, a, I think, Heart of Gold I was reading about the recording technique. And it was a 157 couple of mics, they didn't even use a compressor. I think they rode the vocal by hand. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was such a minimalist recording, Heart of Gold. And it, was a, it sold a million copies. It was a huge hit for him. Mm -hmm. But the production technique was completely minimalist on it. I mean, they did nothing to that. You know, they didn't even use a compressor. Mm -hmm. I think they said they were riding the vocal. They didn't even have the vocal through a compressor. And then when he was singing soft, they were, they were riding it while he was recording. And they were moving the fader. So, <laughs> so uh, again, I think it's a matter of of simplicity. I mean, uh, there are more tools that you could buy that you need. You know, uh, you don't need to use them all. You know, if you're painting a house, you don't need a hammer. <laughs> you need a brush. You need a brush to paint a house. So, you know, we have this collection of tools out there. And you have to really look at what the application of the job is. What are you doing with these tools, you know? Well, yeah, you need a hammer if you're, you know, if you're hanging up a, a picture or something to, to put it, but you don't need a paper, you know? Like I said, it's, it's, I think it's a question of deciding what tools you need for the job and what the job is. And that's basically my, my, my ideas about microphones. Um, you know, again, we were talking about detail in microphones. Sometimes you don't want too much detail, you know? You want to obscure the singer a little bit. You don't want a perfect um, replication of his voice because his voice isn't perfect and maybe he's not a good singer, you know? So I think really knowing what the job is and assessing what you need and also, this is not on the topic of microphone, but it's also assessing what the musicians need to be comfortable, you know? What tools you need, what psychology you need to get the group to play good. Um, these are, I think, the most important things, you know? And I think that a lot of modern production techniques, and I've seen a lot of engineers, and it, it's, it's, I think they're... Because they started maybe gaming or something when they were five years old. They were doing video games and stuff. They're kind of treating music like a video game, you know? They're kind of overdoing things and, you know, kind of using the computer too much. And, you know, I mean, they're kids and, and they're engineers and stuff, but it's a different approach, you know? It's almost an abuse of the technology, you know? Because really, it's a very simple thing, you know? I mean, the computer... I just use like a like a tape machine. I record everything in a line, and I try to manipulate it as little as possible. Hmm. You know? I don't really like using the computer. Hmm. I don't like using my phone for things. I mean, I'd rather I'd rather listen, and I'd rather try to, I think, collect as much information as I said about what the group wants and how they want to be represented and what tools you need, what microphones or what pieces of equipment you need to make the group happy. Because as you know, as a studio, there is nothing worse of somebody leaving the studio after making a record and, and not being happy with it, you know, because they have to live the rest of their lives with it, you know. But the problem is sometimes clients don't know what they want and you have to tell them, okay, you know, they don't know exactly what they, how they should be represented, but there's nothing worse than the feeling of, uh, of walking away saying like, oh, you know, how's your new record sound? Well, I don't like, really like it too much, you know? I mean, you know, the objective is, you know, being that these records 
are going to exist for years after we die and their grandkids are going to hear them. And again, you know, we're talking about people say, oh, you know, nobody's going to listen to my record from 20 years from now. It's not true because, I mean, Iggy and the Stooges, Radio Birdman, the Sonics, all these group, groups have more fans now than they did when they were playing. <laughs> I mean, the Stooges were a, a commercial disaster that were thrown off of, yeah, MC5. I mean, you know, none, none of you ever, anybody thought that music was going to be, be around. You know, mm -hmm. but now it's more popular than it was at the time they were making it. You know, Robert Johnson, for, for example. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and nobody knew who he was. You know, now everybody knows who Robert Johnson is. You know, mm -hmm. but at the time, the, the guy didn't make any money. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's unfortunate that you know you have to die and uh, before you get any recognition as as an artist. Mm -hmm. But you know, sometimes it takes twenty, thirty years for people to even understand a record. You know. And when you go back and you see, okay, hey, Brian Wilson did Smiley Smile, and there's all these mixes, and you can, you know, it's 20 different versions, and people are just crazy about, you know, mm -hmm. you know, having it all, and just seeing how this record that was done like 50 years ago or whatever, you know, like the process that it went through and the development stage, and and you know why certain decisions were made at the time, you know, so it's kind of curious that, it, you know. It might take the public 50 years or something to discover your record. And maybe you're dead after that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you'll live to, 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 you know, to get the appreciation and connect, to reach the people that you initially wanted to connect. But it took 30 years to do that. <laughs> Con todo tu bagaje y toda tu experiencia en los estudios de grabación, habrás visto cosas inusuales, fuera de la norma. Eh, cuéntanos alguna experiencia un poquito especial, por favor. Well, really, there's nothing I really want to tell. I mean, you know, I, I think certainly in music and, and filmmaking and you're going to have, you know, stories about people taking drugs and, and people doing things and people doing crazy things and, you know, people... Um, you know, not being in the best form in the studio, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to mention any names and stuff, but mm -hmm. certainly I'm glad. I think there's a lot less drug usage and drinking in the studio than there was in the 80s or 90s, which was basically a party. And I know that the same was going on in Hollywood, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, but I think people are a little bit more relaxed about it now. Um... But there was one interesting story that I'll tell that's not really particularly about craziness in the studio, but we had the opportunity when I was in Gijon, I was working at a festival called Crossroads, and Sonny Burgess, who recorded at Sun Studios and, you know, pl yeah, played, his group played with Elvis and everybody who was on Sun. I mean, the guy started mm -hmm. when he was 18 in Sun Studios. Now, he was still alive, and he was playing at the festival in Gijon, and I was working there at the Crossroads Festival. And I met, you know, I met him, I spoke English, and I was working at the festival, and I said, Man, I'm really pleased to meet you, I'm a big fan of your music. And I said, we, you know, we have this analog, old analog studio mm -hmm. in Gijon, if you guys want to come and record a couple of songs, we'd love to have you, you know. Mm -hmm. So he said, yeah, 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 he seemed real, really excited, you know. And these guys are like 70 years old, you know. Mm. I mean, they were, you know, they were, mm -hmm. they, they'd seen everything. I mean, they'd, they'd been, they started making records in 19, like 1958 or something, even earlier, you know. And they were in Sun Records, recorded by Sam Phillips. So we brought them into Parodi to record a couple of songs. We didn't know exactly what they were going to do. They were five old guys. And they were just so happy to be in the studio So they wound up recording a full album, and w it was a Sunday, and they had played a show. You know, we thought they're old, and you know they're not gonna make it. And we said, look, you know, on Sunday we'll take you out for a fabata, and you know, you, you guys can have a look. And they said, no, no, we're having fun. You know, I mean, these old guys, and then they were they were arguing like teenagers, like <laughs> like you know, the bass player saying, let's do Honey Don't. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, he was like, ah, I hate that fucking song. I, they were like, they were like kids, you know. So in the end, we didn't have lunch. I said, are you guys hungry? You know, and they and they said, no, but can we get some candy bars at the store? Cross. I said, oh, I went with Sun Burgess, and they bought like chocolate, you know, candy bars. And they're all eating. They're they didn't want to stop recording, you know. And they were like seventy years old, and they were like they were like little kids, you know. They were just so excited to be in the studio, you know. And I I I really never seen that much of excitement for guys that have been doing it for like you know 50 60 years had been in all kinds of studio situations had recorded with sam phillips and they were the most exciting people <laughs> that i'd ever recorded <laughs> has producido bandas como the bill dogs new Bomb turks eh, que diferencias eh, hay entre esas producciones ese tipo de producción a las que haces actualmente um I think, you know, initially, a lot of the groups in the 90s never really thought it was important or their records were going to get recognized. I think now people maybe are kind of trying that they, they, they want to have the success level, you know. And I think sometimes you have to try, but I think when you try to be successful, it doesn't work, you know. <laughs> So I think there's a lot of groups that I think really trying to be successful. I think, uh, you know, basically in the 90s, the groups were just thought it was a great thing to be in the studio and maybe hoped that somebody would listen to the record or something. But I think some of the, 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 the groups today, I don't think they're as prepared f to go into the studio. And I think that they think that, you know, There's a lot of uh, pressure to get things perfect and get things right, and you know, like we got one chance to make it. You know, if we if we mess up, you know, you know, I'm gonna go back to, to working in an office. You know, you know, there's a little bit of pressure, I think, to because there's more competition. I think there's more groups. You know, and I, I think it's very difficult to uh, for groups to compete on the market because. The reality is, uh, it's a very closed market now, um, and there's more groups, and there's less records being sold, and there's less records being listened to, I think, and we can talk about this later, I think it's important to, to realize the changes in, in the public and how they listen to music, because nobody can really listen to an LP of mm -hmm. 20 minutes and then listen to, you know, people can't even listen to a, a, a 40 minutes worth of music in the same record. And if you look at Spotify statistics, I was talking to uh, the singer of Bebe Said and a group, group from, um, from Barcelona during the 80s. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of making a comeback and they'd never used Spotify. And they made a record of 10 songs. And the singer says... I checked our stats, our statistics on Spotify. Everyone listens to the first song and nobody can even make it down mm -hmm. to like the tenth song. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's kind of an, an, another another story. But I think it's the difference between 1990 and and now is not so much the music or the technology has changed, but the way people listen to music has changed. Mm. This is this is the problem. <laughs> and this is <laughs> this is the effect that you know that we're all facing that and people again, people just don't have the attention to watch a, a two hour movie. They can't do it. You know, they, they can watch a TikTok video for mm. for 15 seconds, but they can't make it through an hour and a half of a movie, you know? I mean, how many people in the pandemic, they start a movie and they watch a half an hour and they start another movie the next day. So they're watching five movies, but they haven't finished any. It's mm -hmm. like reading a book, you know? Mm -hmm. You read a book, you put it down, pick up another book. It's good. So this is, this is, I think, the problem of the attention span of the public today and how they're perceiving your music. I mean, and I think because a lot of it is governed by image because now you can record a concert and maybe the sound is terrible. So that's documentation of a group that 
I personally don't think should be circulating. You know, I wouldn't want to see mm. see me playing terrible sound out of tune and saying, oh, "Yeah, look at him. He can't even tune his guitar." Okay, maybe I was having a bad night. You know, but that's what's circulating the promotion is the image. You know, mm. because images now are available readily. Now, if you take a group like Pink Floyd, like these, nobody even knew what they wore on stage. They wore T-shirts. They had a light show. That was their image. But personally, they weren't seen. You didn't even know if they were on stage or not. You know, if it was the right guy. I mean, they they completely avoided having their personal image be the image of the group. Now, Bowie made a point of having his image represent his music. The Pink Floyd completely avoided. They could walk down the street and nobody knew who they were, you know. Bowie or Jagger, everybody knows if you know if they're walking down the street. Mm -hmm. So, so I think having being able to avoid what people perceive as your image, and I think even looking at an LP record, I mean, I think people buy them on the cover art. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, if it's a naked woman or if it's a cartoon or if it's a picture of Betty Page, they'll they'll buy it because mm -hmm. you know. That's kind of their visual interpretation of what they think the music they're going to like is going to be inside. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's a rockabilly guy. It's got a tattoo. He's dressed up like a rockabilly. He's playing a Gretsch. Oh yeah, I'll buy that. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think I think once you separate music from image is really important because I don't think every year I think music is more dependent on image. And when MTV started in the 80s, people realized that, like, if you had a strong image and your video was on MTV, you were going to sell records and you were going to get famous, you know, mm -hmm. because it was a new medium, you know, mm -hmm. of capturing the image of, of a rock video. Prior to that, you could have groups playing on shows like American Bandstand and they'd be, you know, doing playback, you know, maybe... But they'd be playing their instruments. But you could actually make a video that was kind of a mini movie or something, mm. you know. And the, all of that happened, I think, in MTV. So I think the relationship between what you see visually and what you like and what you hear, you know, are two different things, you know. Mm. I mean, if the singer's a very attractive woman or something, maybe you'll think differently than if it's a guy who looks like uh, a drunk like Charles Bukowski and doesn't have any teeth, you know. <laughs> maybe you'll think differently about it, depending on what image you're being shown, you know. So, I mean, I think in the 60s and really all the way up to the 80s, the, the image of the artist, like Dylan, you'd see a picture of him on the cover, and that would be it. Maybe you'd see him on TV, but you couldn't look at them when you wanted to on the internet. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you couldn't do it. So he had control of his image, you know, because he put the picture he liked on the on the cover of the record. Mm. You know? Sure, there were photos of him walking on the street and people taking pictures of him, but these were professional photographers, a lot of them, yeah. you know, mm. who had good cameras, you know. So I think that the artist now has less control of what people think the image is, you know, mm -hmm. because images are circulating all over, all over on YouTube, and, you know, we can't really control that, you know. Dinos nombres de estudios de grabación donde has trabajado, y los que más te gustan, eh, el mejor recuerdo que tienes, eh, por el equipo, por el espacio. <laughs> well, I'll start, I'll start because we recorded here with the Pick and Boppers, <laughs> and the record just came out. A little bit of promo for the Pick and Boppers. So, uh, uh, Jesus is bringing me a vinyl tomorrow of, of the record that we made here, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'll be happy to hear it on my turntable because I've mastered it and I've listened, I've mixed it, and I've listened to it on a computer, but I want to hear that record at my house, you know. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow I'll be able to hear that. But the studios that I've been in really have been numerous. I mean, there's probably been about a hundred studios that I've worked in, that many in Tokyo, mm -hmm. Prague, Sono in Prague was a, I mean, that place was had a Neve the size of this room. They had 
they were recording the the Prague Symphony Orchestra. They had chairs. I mean, this place was, you know, and they had rock groups in there too. They were progressive rock groups, but this place was like a palace, huge. The biggest studio I'd ever been in was in Sono in Prague. But, you know, it was only for like a four-day session that I was there. But the principal studios that I really worked at were Coyote in Brooklyn. Um, and Coyote was really probably the top of the... I'm not saying top quality, but because the engineers and the technicians were good. The Ramones were doing demos at Coyote. The Dictators were always were there, the Flesh Stones. I mean, you'd always run into somebody at Coyote, you know? It was kind of the New York staple of the 80s and 90s. Um, when I moved to Texas, I started using Sweatbox and a couple of other studios, but primarily it was Sweatbox, which was a real, again, real down and dirty studio. It was, you know, but the technicians were good and they understood what they were doing. They were great people and I learned a lot from them too. Barcelona was sold to Sans, which was a great is a great studio almost too luxury for a lot of the punk groups that were in there mm -hmm. um those three were the main studios that i worked at uh you know other studios in madrid studio brazil was great um and uh you know a couple uh, circle variety i forgot them uh, <laughs> home great studio uh, -huh. uh totally anal analogic studio a little bit diff diff difficult to work in, in, with some of the equipment there but really kind of a lot of magical old sounds come came out of that place i was there for five years that was one of the studios that i was working out of and really not too many others uh you know new york some of the higher end studios like electric ladyland and mm -hmm. and, and uh, places I never worked at because they were just out of the budget of the money that we had. I mean, great places and stuff and groups like Aerosmith had recorded there and stuff. And I've been to those studios, but normally I work, worked in, in medium-sized studios. I mean, I think the most luxury studio that I worked in was Sold to Sans, mm -hmm. you know, because they had two pianos and a very big room and, uh, you know, they had an Eve console for a while. Um, but conversely, I think that a lot of studios, if they're not, if they're too fancy, if they're too luxurious, uh, groups that don't have any experience are, are intimidated, uh -huh. you know? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like walking into the dentist office mm -hmm. or something, you know, they kind of like all these lights and things and, you know, um, depending on the group, you know? If it's a group that has a lot of experience in those studios, then they, they feel feel comfortable. But mm -hmm. you know, if it's a punk rock group that's not being used mm -hmm. to, you know, you kind of want it to be like their 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 practice space because that's what they know. You know, mm -hmm. they don't want to feel like you know, you know, oh, you know it's, yeah. the place is expensive. You know, it's, it's like restaurants. You know, you don't. <laughs> you know, some people don't like fancy restaurants. I don't. I don't particularly think that you know. Mm -hmm. Eating a paella in a, in a in in a fancy restaurant is better than one night and get down the street made by a grandmother in a container. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, th depending on the on the you know what the again what the needs of the artists are. But I mean, I think every studio has got its characteristics and 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 uh, method of working. I think part of the problem is that regardless of what the equipment that the studio has in it, I think it's important that the technicians and the studio owners can kind of be flexible with the times, you know, mm -hmm. because certain people don't want to work after nine or like, for example, sold the sounds, we had to stop at nine because of the neighbors, yeah. certain drummers, they can't, they can't play mm -hmm. until after nine. You know, they're so used to playing at night mm -hmm. or playing gigs you can't get them good at 10 o'clock in the morning. They're not ready to play. <laughs> so, so I think the hours of the studio have to accommodate the musicians. I mean, I don't personally like going till 4 o'clock in the morning, but if the singer is, is going to be good at, four, at 3 o'clock in the morning, mm. I'm going to get that singer at, four, at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know? Because I know the singer's not going to be good from 10 
to five in the morning. Mm. He or she won't be able to sing because that, they don't do that. You know, mm. it's kind of like playing in a small dark club and then having to play in the light when it's hot at an out, outdoor stage in Valencia mm. in the summer. You know, it's a different experience. You know. <laughs> Some people can't do it, you know? So I think depending on, like, when the time that you're going to capture the artist is important. To say that everybody's going to come in at 10 and play their best doesn't necessarily mean that's going to happen. <laughs> it might happen at 10 at night. It might happen 5 o'clock in the afternoon, you know? You don't know when you're going to reach that, you know, that moment where the group's on fire, you know? And that's what you got to do because the reality is... If you're making a 40-minute record or a 30-minute record, you're making 30 minutes worth of music. You don't really need 10 days to make that, you know, 30 minutes worth of music, you know? Mm -hmm. you, know it, you, you can spend 10 days in the studio and do it, and maybe it'll, it'll be better and maybe it'll be worse, but the idea is trying to capture that 30 minutes of music that the public's going to get at the best moment that you can get it. And you don't know when that moment's going to be, but you got to wait it out, you know. And again, you got to see the interaction with the group. Sometimes people like to eat. Sometimes people need to have a drink. Sometimes people drink too much, you know. It's the same energy that, 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 that they, when they get on stage, you know. And I've seen groups that are great after maybe they'll have two beers and they go on stage. But if they're sitting waiting and they're playing late... And they have five beers and they're terrible because they're drunk. <laughs> they're not and they're not playing at their best. So you kind of got to gauge that uh, that that golden moment. And really, as a photographer, when they say five o'clock in the afternoon, if you're shooting outside, is the golden hour because the sun is and the light and everything is. You know, you're gonna get your best photo at that, at that time because you know the sun is positioned there and the lighting and everything is good. So then you kind of have to wait for that time. You know. But in music, you never know when it's going to happen, you know? Mm. And ultimately, if it doesn't happen, it's my fault. <laughs> because, <laughs> because I didn't capture the group at, at their best moment. Well, the problem was the group didn't have a good moment that day. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> Diferencias entre analógico y digital. ¿Qué prefieres a día de hoy? Well... There are great things about digital, and I think it's really gotten gotten good in the past five years as far as the quality of sound. And what I like about digital is when you're working on tape, there's always this thing about the, the pr price of the tape, taking takes and erasing them. And then you're re, re, rewinding. To, I mean, there's a lot of time that's be, and energy that's being consumed mm -hmm. by the medium of, of working the tape machine. You know? Mm -hmm. you know, if you're on a limited budget and you're paying 200 euros for a real tape, you got a bad take, maybe you got a three-minute song, you want to move it here. But there's a lot of time that's being wasted in, in analogic by using the tape machine, rewinding the tape. So it's time consuming and it's gotten expensive to, to mm -hmm. buy tape. Digital is great because you can basically go from one song to here, boom, 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 you know, really f quickly. And that's saving a lot of time and we, we make less money <laughs> because that goes quicker. So you have access to completely comparing a mix. If you want to hear a mix, bam, 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 I mix it here. You listen to the next one, mm -hmm. wow, that song doesn't have any bass drum. This one's got a lot of bass drum. You can make comparisons really quickly. You can move quickly in digital. These things are, are I think, beneficial in digital. Analog, I mean, I love because of its, its classic sound. And the other thing I like about analog is that you have to make the decision, the group has to make the decision on time. Was that a good take? You can only keep one mm -hmm. because we can't pay for you know. So the, it keeps the group a little bit aware. And if they, they say, well, you know, I kind of, that drum fill I did wasn't too good. Okay, you got to do it better now, you know, mm -hmm. because we got to erase that, you know. I think having to make that decision to say, mm -hmm. 
I can't do this any better. This is this is the take. I'll live with it. I don't like my drum fill in the middle, but the singer did great, or the guitar player solo. You know, you know, I'll I'll make that compromise. You know, mm. uh, now it's nobody's making that compromise. You know, <laughs> now you pick up the drum from this take, you put it there, you move the guitar solo over here. Um, I think the uh, you know being alert and and knowing the process and making being able to make a decision in analog and say. I made that decision. I got to move on. Mm. You know, in digital, it never happens. People don't don't want to make the decision. You know, and and say, no, well, we have another take of that scene. Well, we can use that guitar from this piece and do that. We can do that. that. And I think that kind of affects the way people play because I think when you know you're going to be able to fix something in digital, that you don't prepare yourself as well. I think when you got one chance to do it on tape. You, the musicians come in more, a little bit more prepared, you know, mm -hmm. because they know if they if if they're not playing good, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to wind up on the record, you know, <laughs> and there's going to be no way to fix it, mm -hmm. you know. But now I think people realize that they can go back and fix things and go back and recut their parts. Everything's isolated, everything's that. If I'm not having a good day, if I'm not playing good, uh, I'll just come in next week and re and redo it, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's given it's given. Look, you know, I like having options and stuff, right? <laughs> but, but if you give too many people options, they don't know what they, they're, they're going to want, you know? If I walk into a restaurant, it's a menu del dia, right? They got three plates for the, for the first plate, right? They got ensalada, they got a, a gazpacho, they got uh, something else, you know, pastel, they, they, whatever. And they got three plates for that, right? You, you kind of know that you're going to have to pick one of the three. <laughs> and if you go to a restaurant that's got a menu that's unlimited, nobody is going to know what they want to eat. You know? <laughs> There's too many things on the menu. You know? But if you kind of have these limitations of choice, you know, then you got to make a decision. You know? But once you're given too many options, that what is kind of confusing people, you know, and that's what digital in effect is doing, mm -hmm. you know, because you're not working with a limited set of options, you know, you're given this almost unlimited set to work with and nothing gets done because you're confused, you know, mm -hmm. and you're worried about the choice you're going to make, you know. Sé que algunos discos los mezclas en casa. Cuéntanos cosas de tu mezcla. Eh, ¿Cómo lo haces y algún proceso que hagas un poco inusual o fuera de lo normal? Well, I only started mixing in, the, in my house this year. It's only been about eight months. Every record that I mixed for 40 years was always mixed in a studio on the board. And being that many studios now don't even have a working board, I just decided to get to mix in my house. Now, I, I, I mi really miss the physical thing of of using the board because I like to use my hands, I always did. Mm -hmm. I tried to use the computer as little as I possibly could. I always tried to mix by hand. The problem with that is clients want changes. It's very difficult to to go in a week later and have all your EQs and everything on the board set up, you know. They say, well, you know, I just want a little bit more bass in this, you know. Well, you know, I don't remember what the board, you know, I had a 24-channel board, everything was, you know, mm -hmm. I don't remember where the reverb, what the EQ was, what compressor, you know. So, so it's hard to make a change for a client um, in a studio, you know. What I do like about mixing in the studio is, is a, the communal sense of having a, the technician there, if I need an opinion, <laughs> <laughs> if I have any doubt about, you know, yeah, you know, well, then, you know, like I don't know your monitors, you know, you know them better than me, so you know if I'm, you know, if I don't have enough bass drum in the mix, you're gonna tell me, you know, mm -hmm. say, hey, this is NS tens, Yamaha, you, you know, mm -hmm. you know, you're gonna need more bass drum than that, you know, because I'm not used to your monitors, you know, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so sometimes I like the input of the engineer. I mean, I've worked with you and Mark Tenna and great engineers. And if, certainly helped projects uh, and I like the communal thing of having a representative at least one member of the band if not the whole band 
there because it's kind of an event, and it's a, again, it's a communal event, and it's the difference between going to a restaurant eating or, or me heating up something from Mercadona in the microwave, you know? I don't like the experience of mixing the house as much. I mean, in one respect, it's great because it's quiet and you don't have people talking, but a respectful band or represent or one person representing the band mm -hmm. will have to take the responsibility if they say, hey, Mike, you know, like the, the, the bass drum is just too loud in everything. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take the bass drum down, you know, mm -hmm. and then the drummer, if the drummer isn't there, he's like, where's my bass drum? You know? <laughs> so somebody's got to take responsibility. It's not me, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, mixing in the house, I'm kind of using my own way, and I can people can write me back, and I can store things, and they can say, well, you know, tambourine's loud here, and next day I can correct it. But, you know, you kind of miss that communal energy, you know? Um, in one respect, I like it because if at 12 o'clock at night I'm listening to a mix I did, Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, man, that, that tambourine's really loud. I got, you know, I'll make a note of it on mm -hmm. a piece of paper at 8 o'clock in the morning next day I can go fix it, you know. Mm -hmm. And the other great thing is a lot of times mastering will affect the mix. Now, I do mastering, and I know the effects of mastering, but sometimes if I'm mastering a song that I've mixed and the tambourine has got a lot of highs and it's right next to a song that has absolutely no high frequencies, mm -hmm. then I got to kind of compensate that in the mix. So maybe I can go back and remix it, you know, and realize that, okay, the sequence, mm -hmm. it's not really what I, you know. So I, I'm trying to mix and get groups to give me the sequence so I can see how the song follows the next song. Like if I'm using the same effect on the voice, say if I got the voice distorted on three songs, I don't know what the sequence is. The group gives me the sequence when I'm mastering. Those three distorted voices happen to be all together. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't. I wouldn't have mixed it that way, you know? Yeah. You know? I don't want three songs together. But, look, I'm old school, and I listen to records mm -hmm. together, you know? Not many people do anymore. So. Mm -hmm. But I like the idea of seeing the continuity mm -hmm. Of, okay, you got 20 minutes of music on the side, and you got 20 mu minutes of music on the other side, mm -hmm. you know? How is this going to play? Rhythmically, or all the songs in E? So I, I think trying to know the sequence and what the finished outcome of what the public is apparently going to listen to, at least the people who listen to vinyl records, mm -hmm. that that record's going to flow, like Exile on Main Street, like any classic record from the from the seventies or sixties, mm -hmm. or anything, I think there's a certain planning that goes on, you know. And I think if you look at things like, you know, I'm I like the Who. Tommy's not my favorite record, but again, mm -hmm. that's a conceptual record that has it, it's written like a book. There's chapters, mm -hmm. you know. And I think records should play out that way, you know. So I think that you know. I'm a little off topic with this as far as like mixing in house, but I think, uh, I think, given the information about what the group wants to, the whole conceptual thing to be, and how that's going to work together, you know, we're not just making we're not just mixing songs. We're mixing we're mixing albums here. I mean, a single's fine because a single is a standalone thing and it doesn't really matter. But I think if you're getting into ten, twelve songs in one package that's going to be sold. You got to conceptually know where what the story is. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's good to have a sequence during the mix. You know, I'm trying to get groups to even commit on that, and I can't get them to commit and give me the sequence. You know, like they have a hard time. I said, look, you know, if you want, I'll do the sequence because the sequence you gave me, you got three songs in E, starting out at the same tempo. <laughs> you know. It sounds like the same song, you know. You got to divide these. You got you got two cover versions, three cover versions, mm -hmm. and they're all together. No, we'll split them up. You got a slow song here. Don't put it next to a slow song, you know. So I think I think trying to step out of I'm working on a record as opposed to who are we selling this to, and what are they going to think of it when they get at home, you know. It's a question of getting on the other side and looking at it, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, we all look at details, you know? 
We all see details. We all think about the hi-hat, the bottom snare drum. You know, people don't think about that stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. These are all parts that, that make up the whole, you know. I mean, you can only look at details too, so much, you know. And the public doesn't understand these. What they understand is a, the, a thing, you know. Like I said, like it's a Cramps record, you know. Mm -hmm. And they're expecting it to sound like the Cramps, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you buy a can of Coca-Cola and you want it to taste like a Coca-Cola, you know. People have expectations of certain things, you know. Mm -hmm. And how you deliver these expectations is part of the job of the producer. You have to be an outside view of the group, you know, mm -hmm. because you're not the bass player. You're not sitting in front of the snare drum. You're not, you know, mm -hmm. all of these components, you know, are important, but that's not what the public understands. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> bueno, Mike, muchas gracias por compartir con nosotros esta valiosa información. Eh, ha sido un honor entrevistarte. Muchas gracias. Well, thank you very much, Paco. It was a pleasure, and a <laughs> believe me, 40, 40 years of playing this game, it's 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 not easy, and I hope. Uh, Uh, the information that I've provided will help uh, you younger generation of people. Good luck with that, and, uh, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. My best friend, this is the Electro Voice 666. Favorite of John Kennedy, Aretha Franklin's favorite microphone. This is the brother of the 666, this is a 665. You can tell the difference between the portals, but they're very similar microphones, very directional. Basically, you gotta hit the thing in the air. If you're off axis that much, you'll lose it. And a very directional microphone. This is broadcast quality for the mid 60s. And as I said, it was the main microphone at Stacks and Chess and many studios in America in the 60s called the Buchanan Hammer because it was made in Buchanan, Indiana. And it's like a hammer. You can kill somebody with this. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I'm divorced and I don't, I don't get near my wife with this because... <laughs> okay, Pleasure Fucker's first abortion. This must have been 1991, maybe. Roy and Yvonne. They were Jamaican legends. Got a copy of that. This is a pleasure to work with them. They're still active. Playing festivals on the reggae circuit. Excitements from Barcelona. This is done in Red Bell Studios with Mortena. This is the Limbos. It was done partially in Madrid and Barcelona. New Bomb Turks, of course. Coyote Records. Two-day session. Parents Woodfield just came out. It was done in Elefante in Valencia, Guadalupe Plata. Recorded this in Austin, Texas, and mixed it in Malaga. Uh, Holler Studio with Maxi. Devil Dogs done a coyote, Brooklyn. As the Ranch Hands done a coyote. This is the first record that I did in Barcelona with Mario Cobo's group, the New Niles. Um, I was living in Austin. Mario called me, I went to Barcelona, it was the first job that I did at Red Bell Studios at Mork Tena quite a while ago, 15 years ago or something. Los Chicos, this is done in Madrid uh, about 10 years ago. And the Sea Chicken we did about five years ago. This is done at Sol de Sans in Barcelona. Sonny Burgess is done at Circo Parodi and This is kind of another topic that I do audio restoration and re-editions. So this is kind of music from the 50s that basically taking vinyl and doing audio restoration. I could talk about that for a day if you want, but, but we'll leave that for another session. But there's a lot of compilations that I've done of older material for Jerome Records, Ike Turner, Bo Diddley and some things that are just cleaning up old vinyl records. 
And, you know, it's labor laborious work. You're getting clicks and trying to clean things. And even sometimes even a record is skipping and you'll have to edit one point and, and make a correction. But, um, you know, it's kind of working on classic stuff and improving it for a whole new generation of people. Um, and improving the sound quality from old discs, uh, tapes that don't exist anymore and things like that. So, you know, conversely, it's kind of nice because you, <laughs> you're, not, you're not working with a group, you're working with a dead guy who doesn't have anything to say about it. <laughs> so you don't have to answer to anybody. <laughs> These are some documents from the 80s from Manhattan that I found in my dead mother's house. <laughs> she kept everything that I... <laughs> I'm lucky to have them, but some of the things that were happening um, at the University of New York. This is kind of interesting. Here three-hour lecture on maintenance, maintaining equipment, soldering, tape recorders, output equipment, some of the course diagrams here. I haven't seen this stuff in years. Luckily, my mother kept it. It's from February 1982. This is kind of interesting because this is dated 1981, June 9th. The technology of why and how digital is used in audio. <laughs> I mean, at the time, you know, when digital came, people thought, ooh, it's a, it's a fad. It's not going to last. It's not going to work. You know, what is this new thing? No, nobody needed digital. You know, so kind of like the internet, people were like, ah, it's never going to work. We're not, we're not, you know, I mean, people first saw a computer, and I was like, ah, you know, what's this computer thing, you know? And then now we're spending our lives with computers, but, you know, I mean, at the time, there were a lot of older guys in the in the business that just said, ah, digital, yeah, so great, they're crazy, you know, never going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> kind, of, kind of a thing that, you know, at the time people were like, ah, you know, no, no, we don't need to know this. It's the same with computers, you know. Well, I don't, I don't need to know it, you know. So, you never know where the future is going to bring you. <laughs> 